should begin this message. Uh, we're dismissing kids, aren't we? We dismiss our kids downstairs, sorry. Should begin this message with a brief apology for my American accent. It just sounds better, Scottish, doesn't it? It just sounds better. Joe, we thank you, brother, uh, for serving us and being here this week. It's been a great week at Renovation Church, hasn't it? You may or may not know this, but uh, this past week we've had countless opportunities to share the love of Jesus Christ with the people of this community. Uh, We do that. We trust each and every week, but this week more intensely and more focused in what we've done. We had eight volunteers plus others that worked together to, uh, over a period of four nights, Monday through Thursday, right here at Heritage Park, uh, uh, teach soccer to about uh, 15 young boys and girls, and uh, each night we also had the opportunity to share the gospel with them and their families and those who walk by. It was truly a privilege. I can't tell you the meaningful conversations that we had. I mean, it was just so wonderful. And also the rapport and the relational uh, connections that were established with some of our own children uh, and also some of the kids in this community. It was such a blessing. And then, of course, yesterday we had the outreach, uh, the community cookout at, at the Heritage Park, where, as I can conservatively estimate, About 120 people came out, many, I would say most of which were not part of our fellowship, they were part of the community, and some of their family members as well. So, uh, and then of course, even a simple brief message of hope for people to hear about Jesus. And I don't know about you, but as we enter the month of August 2023, which by the way, is our 10th year anniversary as a church, which is just wonderful to think about, right? Most churches die that start, that are planted. Most churches die in the first couple years. And to think that God has sustained us thus far and continues to give us a sense of identity and purpose and mission in this community is just such a wonderful thing to think about. So Renovation Church, happy 10th year anniversary. We're going to talk about that probably a lot in the next couple months. Uh, Some of our series will will focus on those things as well. We're going to have a big party celebration service on October 15th, Sunday night, will be our 10th year anniversary celebration service. The point is this, God has planted us here. We're on mission to share the gospel with every man, woman, and child in this community and everyone else that we know that God's given us a privilege to be in relationship with. What What a foundation that has been laid for us that we continue to build upon, Amen. And so thank you for being a part of it. If you've been here for 10 years, it's been amazing to see. If you've been here for just 10 days, maybe your first time, uh, we trust that you'll see that God's at work here and his grace is evident and that Jesus is the center of everything that we do. Amen? We want the world to know that. And so we trust that will continue. Today we continue our series in Ecclesiastes. Grab your Bibles. Oh, we're going to need our Bibles today. You're going to need to have your pens your highlighters, whatever. Maybe you're just going to use your app on your phone. That's fine. But we are going to need to be in the Scriptures today. Do you hear me? You're going to be patient with me today, right? Like always. Uh, I want to invite our friend uh, Joe, too, to come forward. He's going to be reading from uh, Ecclesiastes. Let's welcome him. to 10, 20. Um, so starting at verse 13. I've also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. There was a little city with a few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor, wise man, and he, by his wisdom, delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that poor man. But I say, the wisdom is better than might. For the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. The words of the wise, heard and quiet, are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Dead flies make the perfumer's anointment give off a stench, so little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. 
Even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense, and he says to everyone that he is a fool. If the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place, for calmness will lay great offences to rest. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, as it were an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in low place. I have seen slaves and horses, and princes walking on the ground like saves. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones is hurt by them, and he who splits logs is endangered by them. If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength. But wisdom helps one to succeed. If the serpent bites before it is charmed, there is no advantage to the charmer. The words of the wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is evil madness. A fool multiplies words, though no man knows what is to be, and who can tell him what will be after? The toil of a fool wearies him, for he does not know the way to the city. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child, and your princes feast in the morning. Happy are you, O land, when your king is a son of nobility, and your princes feast at the proper time, for strength and not for drunkenness. Through sloth the roof sinks in, and through idleness the house leaks. Bread is made for laughter, and wine gladdens life, and money answers everything. Even in your thoughts do not curse the king, nor in your bedroom curse the rich, for a bird of the air will carry your voice, or some winged creature tell the matter. Amen. This is God's word. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would fill us, open our eyes, that the spirit of wisdom would work in our hearts, draw us to you, and strengthen us, we ask, in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. The preacher continues to be observant. Right? We've seen that. He's... In his, over the time of his life and in the course of his days, he has uh, opened his eyes to see. He's made observations. And he's, uh, you get a sense that he's, that he's praying, like he's seeking the Lord to understand, to make sense of life under the sun. And as he continues to make these observations, he's piecing these things together like a puzzle. And in his own mind, it begins to get clearer and clearer. And now he wants to share wisdom. He wants to share with us what life is like under the sun what, and how to apply wisdom under the sun. And so he tells of an example in life. He tells the story of this small city that came under attack by a great and powerful king. Right? This king had resources. This king had weapons. This king had power. Much strength did this great king have. And he built these great siege works against the city. And if you were a betting man or woman, if you saw the Vegas line, you would be like, okay. We know who's going to win this battle, right? Put all your money on the great king with the great strength and all the weapons. But we're told something different by the preacher. We're told that while this city was small and it was inhabited by just a few people, there was one man in that city that was poor but we're told he was wise. That in this city there was a poor, wise man that was there, and we're told by the preacher that despite all this power, all these resources, that this poor, wise man delivered the city from the great king. How can that be? How is that even possible? And he tells us, verse 16, he tells us because wisdom is better. Verse 
16, wisdom is more valuable than strength. It carries more weight. He goes on verse 17, that wisdom whispered is better than the volume of the powerful. Wisdom whispered is better. He tells us that wisdom is better than resources, verse 18. He's saying this. Wisdom has supreme value above strength, above um, volume, and above resources. So he's telling us, given the supreme value of wisdom, prize it and pursue its application in your life. Prize wisdom and pursue its application in your life. See wisdom today for what it is, friend. See its supreme value. In our time in the UK, we uh, spent some time in London. And, you know, Doreen, let's go to London Tower. Okay. Sure. Sounds great. So we go to London Tower. And then she's like, let's stand in the 90-minute line for the crown jewels. And I said, okay, let's stand in the 90-minute line. And so we stand in the 90-minute line, and they lead us through. Everybody's hungry, right, Maisie's? Joe knows we live for food. Where are we eating next? It's vacation. And I'll never forget what I saw. The most shocking part of that trip was how majestic those jewels were. It blew me away. They were gorgeous. They shined unlike any other thing. And I couldn't help but think, how valuable are these crown jewels? How do you put a price tag on those diamonds and rubies and the gold? Such value. And you see the nation guards it, locks it up, right? Prizes this as so precious to them. The preacher is saying, prize wisdom. Wisdom is one of the crown jewels of the divine nature. Wisdom. Prize wisdom. Seek to apply it in your life. Why? Because true Wisdom saves us from the strength of evil that comes against us. Wisdom saves from evil. Prize it. But he goes on to tell us, verse 15 and 16, no one remembers the poor man. We're confronted with a tragedy. No one remembers the poor man. No one, um, it says, through the poor man's wisdom though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. So there's this precious thing known as the wisdom of God, but no one remembers it. It's despised. Its message goes unheard. Such a tragedy. Is that not true in our world? Not to stay in Europe, but I'll never forget the number of times I've been in Edinburgh, Scotland, and gone up the Royal Mile and stopped at St. Giles, the church where John Knox preached. John Knox was the father of the Scottish Reformation. You go into this church where you see, like, whoa, this is where John Knox preached. And you're like, where is the memory of John Knox here? It's hard to find. There's his pulpit, but where is his memory? To find his statue that used to be in the public square, you have to kind of find one of the corners of the church where there's a little plaque. And you realize that he's been replaced in the public square by David Hume, the atheist philosopher. And that now his, even his grave is relegated to parking spot 23. 
just to the side of the cathedral. Wisdom is forgotten. It's despised. Wisdom is unheard. I think that's a cause of reflection for us. What do we like to hear? Right? People say all the time, people hear what they want to hear. You ever hear that cliche? You believe what you want to believe. You hear what you want to hear. I think that's true. So what are you hearing? What are you listening to? Prize wisdom, the preacher says, and pursue its application in your life. But the sad reality is that many of us just simply want to hear what we want to hear. And it's easy to ignore and minimize our need for wisdom. It's easy to choose something else that suits our fancy or points us to the kind of pleasures that we seek to live under in this life. But he's warning us. He's, he's telling us, don't forget. Don't despise. Don't ignore wisdom. Prize it. Seek its application in your life. But then he goes on to talk about wisdom's counterpart. He wants us to understand something about wisdom, but he also wants us to think about its counterpart. He wants us to interact a little bit with the reality of foolishness and folly. And he goes on to tell us, verse, nine, uh, verse 18 of chapter 9 and, and verse 1 of chapter 10, he says, wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Just one. You think of a city full of wisdom, wise people, but you have one sinner. One sinner can destroy much good. Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench, so a little folly, just a little, outweighs wisdom and honor. As valuable as wisdom is, it is vulnerable. That's what he's trying to tell us. As valuable as wisdom is, wisdom is vulnerable. It's, even a little folly destroys good and outweighs wisdom. Like a drop of poison in a bucket of clean water. Just one drop destroys the good. It outweighs wisdom. Just a little bit of folly, even one sinner in the company of many virtuous citizens can infect the whole. Folly has a destructive power in life. Even a little bit of it. So don't miss that. Don't miss that. Recognize folly for what it is. Understand that it is powerful and pervasive. And just a little bit of it can destroy much good and outweigh even the, the great wisdom that we may or may not have. And so verses 4 of chapter 10 through verses 20, the preacher is giving us examples of how a little folly, a little folly can destroy good. How a little folly can outweigh wisdom and honor. And I am going to fly through this like Usain Bolt. And then you're going to do a couple things. Are you ready? You're going to go, huh? <laughs> and then you're going to go, thanks, Mike, for making that quick. All right? This is a very difficult, seemingly random, all over the place, maybe hard without reflection, hard to apply section of Scripture. So bear with me. I'm trying to simplify it as concisely as I can. If there was ever a need to get together in a missional community and talk about this amongst other brothers and sisters in the Lord, it was this week. Hint, hint, MC leaders. This may be helpful to sit down with some others and think about these things, okay? I'm going to give you seven ways, oh yeah, seven ways that folly expresses itself. Are you guys ready? Good. Number one, as goofy as I've been to introduce this, this is not a goofy thing. In practice, 
Folly promotes a lack of emotional restraint. It affects our emotions. Verse 4 shows us that. Wisdom says stay calm when the stakes are high. Stay calm. But folly, in contrast, even a little bit, leads us toward a lack of emotional restraint in pivotal moments in life. Some of you may easily identify with that. Number two, in verses five through seven, folly clouds discernment in decision making. Folly clouds discernment in decision making. Wisdom says to the leader, appoint wise people, honorable people to positions of authority around you. That's what wisdom says. Treat positions of honor with dignity and honor. That will bring about good for those who are under your authority. But verses 5 through 7 tell us that folly has a way of clouding discernment for those who have to make decisions in this regard. Folly leads them to evaluate character wrongly. And such decisions and appointments uh, negatively affect those under their care. That's what folly does. Number three, looking at verses 8 and 9 of chapter 10, folly leaves us unprepared as we face danger. Wisdom says be realistic about how the world works. It says take precautions in life and in your work. Understand the risks. Prepare. Use caution. Think it out. Consider all the possible outcomes. But folly says, nah, bro, we're good. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. We'll figure it out as we go. No need to take precautions. No need to think through the possible outcomes. That's folly. And what folly does is it leaves us unprepared for some of the most dangerous moments of life. For situations that are of great risk. That's what folly does. Looking at verses 10 and 11, the fourth thing that folly does is it causes us to hurry when we should hesitate. It causes us to hesitate when we should hurry. Oftentimes, wisdom and folly, making the right choice or the wrong one, going the right way or the wrong way, is simply a matter of timing, isn't it? That's what wisdom says. Now's the time to act. Don't wait, wisdom says. Or vice versa. No, 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 no. Wait. Hold off. Think it through and then act. But folly leads us to hurry At the wrong time. It leads us to hesitate at another and it puts us at risk. That's what folly does. Looking at verses 12 through 14 and also verse 20, we see that folly expresses itself in our words. It comes out of our mouth and what we say. We often know who a fool is by what they say. Right? We know that in Scripture. Right? Wisdom says, be careful what you say. Hold your tongue. Use few words. But folly says, yap away. Vomit verbally on people. Let it all out. That's what folly says. It expresses itself in our words. Number six, Folly disorients our sense of direction. Wisdom says, go that way. But as we're infected with folly, we begin to think, nah, maybe this way is better. We ignore the voice of wisdom. We come up with our own understanding and our own way, and we say, nah, I'm going this way. And we walk away from wisdom toward folly. In last, verses 16 through 19, we see that folly inspires immature living at the expense of others. Again, he's talking about it from the perspective of a king. This is Solomon. He's talking about it in many ways in the political world. But understand that the principles that he's talking about are applicable to anyone in any kind of situation. 
who has any kind of leadership and authority, whose life, the person that recognizes that their life impacts other people regardless of how much influence you have. And he says, folly in the hands of a leader breeds immaturity, and immaturity shows itself to live it out at the expense of other people. He's saying, man, it's good for the people when the leaders mature. There's blessing for the people, right? When he's self-disciplined rather than self-indulgent. We understand the negative effects of people when a leader or a ruler or a politician or a decision maker, someone with authority, thinks only of themselves and leads out of self-indulgence rather than the good of the people. He said, that's what folly does. It destroys good. You look at me and you say, whoa, what is going on? This is a lot. You know, and the sad reality is it is a lot. That's what folly does. It's pervasive, right? Even a little bit of it has the ability to destroy much good. Even one sinner can ruin it for all of us. That's the nature of folly. It's powerful. It's pervasive. It makes wisdom vulnerable in our lives. And so here we are. Again, given the value of wisdom, given the destructive power of even the most little degree of folly, prize wisdom. Prize it and pursue its application. Prize wisdom. Practice it. But when I hear that, I don't know about you, but I start to get a little bit discouraged because I understand of my my own inadequacy and my own inability. I'm confronted with wisdom. I'm confronted with my own tendency to live into folly and foolishness to forget the words of the wise, to follow my own way. I feel so weak. Do you? In some ways we hear this call, given its value, prize wisdom, practice wisdom, and immediately I'm confronted with the fact that I can't. I can't do it. A little bit's going to get me. Feel weak. And it's in this moment that we come to realize the source of the issue. Right? The source of the issue in our weakness is open for our eyes to see. And the preacher tells us in verse 2 and 3 of chapter 10 a wise man's heart inclines him to the right. But a fool's heart to the left. Even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense. And he says to everyone that he is a fool. The fool lacks sense. There's a lack in us. There's a a weakness in us. And the issue is a heart issue. You could say it this way. Folly spreads through life so easily because folly springs from the heart. Folly spreads through life because folly springs from the heart. You may have heard the proverb, guard your heart. Why? For from it flows the wellspring of life. Guard your heart. Jesus said it as well, didn't he, in uh, in Mark chapter 7. He made it very clear. He said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. Out of the heart comes foolishness. Foolishness is a heart issue. And so once again, we come to this realization. 
We're broken. We're dead in our sins and our transgressions. We're corrupt. We've fallen into our sin and folly. For us to prize and pursue wisdom, we need a new heart. Don't miss that today. For you to prize and pursue wisdom, you need a new heart. Wisdom must first be received from the source. In order to prize wisdom and pursue wisdom, you must first receive wisdom from the source. And the wonderful news is God knows this, and he is a heart surgeon. That's what we see the scriptures reveal. He knows our sin and folly. He knows our inability to live wisely. He knows how such folly infects the whole of our life. He knows that folly will destroy the good and outweigh the wisdom in our life. And guess what? He provides his wisdom for us. He provides his wisdom to us. He sent his only son, his very own wisdom, Jesus himself, into the world to conquer human folly. And this we declare to you today. Jesus came, he lived, and he died, and he conquered human folly for us. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul told the Corinthians this. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. It may seem silly to you, but the wisdom and power of God is Christ and him crucified. Hear it today and receive it. Embrace it by faith. And the wonderful news is, as we see it and we embrace it and we prize the wisdom of God in Jesus Christ, he then fills us with the spirit of wisdom. He gives us a new heart. Amen? Amen. That's the gospel. He regenerates us. He causes us to be born again to a living hope. We have a new heart and we trust in him as a consequence of that. Faith in Jesus is the way that we receive wisdom from the source. So receive wisdom from the source today. Jesus, receive him by faith. Turn away from your own wisdom and see the wisdom of God and trust in it. Receive it from the source. And some of us say, yeah, I've done that. But man, I'm still struggling. I still wrestle. It's easy to despise and forget and to do my own thing. I feel the tension in my heart, this battle between the spirit that now lives in me and the flesh in which I live day by day. I, feel, I still feel weak. Well, the wonderful news is when God puts his spirit in you, it's like he puts a well inside of you that continues to spring up, right? And he calls us to continue to drink. It's like he gives us three cups from which to draw from. Three cups. We always have access to the well when the Spirit lives inside of us. He says, hey, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to provide you a constant increase, a constant measure of my wisdom and my grace all the time that you can always drink from. Here are the three cups to continually seek wisdom and receive wisdom at the source. Wisdom must constantly be pursued at the source. And so he gives us at least three cups The first one is this, we pursue wisdom from the source in prayer. If you're struggling with the tension of folly and wisdom, you don't know what to do, you have a difficult time discerning the will of the Lord in your emotions, in your decisions, in your preparation, you're not sure, this is a wonderful way to gain wisdom. Pursue God in prayer. Pray for yourself. Lord, give me wisdom. You're the source. And I'm at the well. I need to drink. And in prayer, we just just keep drinking. We keep drinking. 
We keep receiving by his spirit in faith, of, in faith in Jesus Christ. Pray this for others, right? You think of Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. I pray that the Father of glory may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your hearts be enlightened. I've heard my wife pray that prayer countless times for people in her life. The spirit of wisdom would fill them. For Christians. Christians. You praying that for your spouse? Are you praying that for your kids? As a parent of teenagers, you start to stop, you actually stop controlling everything they do. Got to let out the rope a little bit. Got to give them a little freedom, right? We're always there for you. But you got to go do your thing. You have to go. You got to, you got to grow up. You see wisdom and folly and the tension and the struggle. We just keep praying. Lord, fill them with the spirit of wisdom. Fill them with the spirit of wisdom. Show them the way. Help them discern the will of the Lord. Are you praying that for your kids? Wisdom saves. You praying? Stakes are high, people. Stakes are high with wisdom and folly. You know that when you're staring at uh, your own in the mirror. You know that when you're staring at your kids. The stakes are high. Let's pray. The second cup from which we drink from, we pursue wisdom from the source in the Word. He's given us this book. Here's wisdom. Need wisdom? Read the book. It's right here. Proverbs 2, 6, for the Lord gives wisdom. Amen to that? The Lord gives wisdom from his mouth. Come knowledge and understanding. I don't know what to do. Have you read the scriptures? No. I'm listening to a podcast, so come on. Wisdom. Wisdom. Need wisdom? Need to drink? Go to the scriptures. He's provided you grace and wisdom in your weakness to help you discern the will of the Lord. Go to the book constantly, daily. Never neglect this constant converse with Jesus in Scripture. He's speaking to you. You're speaking to him in prayer. Go to the book. Experience tells me the more I'm in the Word, the more the Spirit of God brings it to mind in the interactions and situations of my life. He's leading me. He's leading me. Pursue Him in the Word. Next, the third cup, we pursue wisdom from the source in community. I heard one person tell me, isolation breeds sin. Let me say it a different way. Isolation breeds folly. You want to walk in foolishness? Cut off biblical community from your life. Don't go to small group. Cancel that coffee appointment with another member. You want to do your own thing and walk in folly? Don't talk to your elders, God's gift to the church, to help you walk in wisdom. Do your own thing. Tell yourself all the time, I'll figure it out. I know enough. I don't need anybody else's influence in my life. If you want to live in folly, do, do you. But the wonderful truth is the Lord has given us each other. The Lord has built and established a people, his church, to be a place of grace and love and support and wisdom and counsel for us when we're about to do the stupidest thing ever. The church says, hey, wait, bro, bro, sister, let me, let me help you. Don't go there. This is the Lord's will. How many times in my life have I been right here in total moronacy? Is that a word? And it was a saint, sweet whisper, that said, I think you should rethink that. I don't think that's what the Lord has for you. We need each other. Prayer, scripture, church, 
Three cups the Lord's given us to constantly drink grace, right? To go to the well that the Lord has put in us, the Spirit. The Spirit works in and through those things to strengthen us, to keep us, and to point the way to wisdom. So that day by day, over time, in our Christian life, we continue to prize and pursue wisdom and practice it and live into it. And we continue to rid ourselves of the sinful folly that is so pervasive and dangerous. You got to get it at the source. Receive it. Constantly seek it. Do so in prayer, scripture, and church. And then when you receive it, live it. That's the spirit filled moment, right? It's that moment where you're at the crossroads. And there it is foolishness, wisdom. And you say, I trust my Savior. I'm filled with my Spirit. I'm in the company of the people of God. There's the way. I'm going to obey. It's obedience. Right? That's how you practice it. You're filled with it. You receive it. You prize it. You practice it. And you do it again and again and again. Look carefully then how you walk, Ephesians 5. Look carefully how then, I'm sorry, look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of the time. Wisdom is the best use of your life. Look carefully then how you walk. Do an evaluation. Consider the source. Do an evaluation. Look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Amen? Friends, trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Be filled with the Spirit. Prize wisdom. Pursue it at the source and practice it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this word this morning. We pray that the Spirit would apply it to our hearts. Lord, open our eyes, fill us with the Spirit of wisdom that our eyes can be opened, that we might know the will of the Lord and to walk in his ways, to be saved from the danger of our enemy, the danger within our hearts. Lord, save us in Christ, our wisdom. Sustain us by grace and help us to live a life that is faithful to you. For the world to see, to you be the glory. And all God's people said, amen.